stuff. You know, uh, which is which is not what we're there for. I, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know. So um, anyway, today was um, on Tuesday. I, I was um, next week. We're doing the Vasa, by the way. Oh. Uh, but the way the way next week is going to work is that um, it's going to be a it's going to be a pre-recorded thing because um, next week's lecture will will falls on um, hang on a minute. Uh, ne next week's lecture falls on the 23rd. So it's basically going to be pre-recorded on Tuesday. It's going to be about the um, that wonderful ship, the Vasa, um, which is the Scandinavian equivalent of the Mary Rose, because it basically went down on its maiden voyage. Um, well, no, um, the Mary Rose was refitted fitted, and when it went went out on its, um, you know, sort of refitted maiden voyage, voyage it went down. The Vasa is very similar. So that's what we're going to be pre-recording for next week. Um, and what, what, what I did on, what I did on Tuesday um, was that I, I, I did um, a three tier thing. Uh, we looked at the, um, we looked at the Roman mosaic that's been found in Rutland. Have we done that? Have we, we haven't done that, have we? No. Now we're going to look at we we we'll look at the Roman the Roman villa that's been found at Rutland with beautiful mosaic. So we're going to we, we I said right. I asked them a question and I said this is what we're going to do today, right? Um, and then I I did the mosaic and then I said uh, then I said right. What is your uh, what is your most um what is your what is your um um hang on a minute what what would be in your um, top 10 of best ever archaeological discoveries made, right? And, um, and I had a list. And when we did the top 10, when we did the top 10, um, it turned out that only one of the, one of the, one of the sites on the list was actually mentioned. So we had... Um, they said, oh, right, the top 10 of the greatest archaeological discoveries, because I had a couple of people away on Tuesday night. I had, uh, I had, how many did I have there? I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, I had three people away. So I'd, I had eight there. And um, yeah, I think I had four away, actually. I had eight there. And um, one said, it's got to be, in the list, it's got to be Godepi Tepe. I thought in that list is going to be Godepi Tepe. It wasn't. Then one of them said, oh, the Chaco Canyon, um, you know, mess, um, Chaco Canyon, um, um, when we're looking at New Mexico and Arizona and we've got Mesa Verde and all the rest of it, one of them, and that's not in the list either. And one of them said the, um, one of them said the, um, the finds in the Amazon, Amazon Basin, it's not in there. I thought, right, okay, we've got to have Petra. That's not in the list of top 10 greatest archaeological discoveries. You've got to have Machu Picchu. That wasn't even in it either, right? <laughs> it was. It was odd. This list, and then, then, right, Sutton who has got to be in it. One of them said, "No, it's not." And then the terracotta army was actually in the list, and one person didn't answer. So, what what I decided to do instead of going down that avenue, what I've got in front of me is something different than I did on Tuesday. It's the top ten discoveries of two thousand and twenty-one, um, and th they're in no order. But we did we did one of them last week. We did Arton, the city of Arton last week. Um, and this is this is written from an American point of view. Now, the top 10 list that I did on Tuesday, the greatest archaeologist discoveries was actually written by a British archaeologist. <coughs> but what well, this list is actually written by an American. Um, and we've got Arton. The Americans love Egypt. Uh, we've got um, world's first artists um prints found in tibet so that was really interesting so we've got one in asia um, um earliest leather worker finds in morocco so we got some some artifacts in morocco this is in 2021 and then we've got evidence of the first americans at white sands in new mexico interesting then we then we go to um the oldest animal carved art which um, was um, found in northern Saudi Arabia. Now, out of all of these, I've only had, this is in 2021. Out of all of these five that I've done so far, only one of them um, I've known about since last week, but I didn't even know about that. Bronze Age map 
of the landscape found in France. Didn't know about that. Rare boundary marker for Rome, for the city of Rome. Didn't know about that. Uh, a new find about a new find from Newfoundland about the Vikings. No idea. Um, a crusader mass grave found in Lebanon. No idea. And a slave tag found in um, a Charleston, South Carolina. Well, it's, it's American, isn't it? So that's going to be in there. Never come across any of them up until two weeks ago. And these are these are discoveries that are made in 2021. So I thought, what we'll do, Goff, right? We're, we're going to we can do it all. We're, we're just going to do the list, right? But what should be in that list is is the new discovery at Rutland, um, the, the mosaic at Rutland um, that was found within the past few weeks um you know they've been excavating it but it's only been reported in the past few weeks so that, that that's that's what we're going to do so that's 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 11 great discoveries this year and actually there's many more and um when i do get articles of the week um you know I, i'm not reading about this because it's talking about other things um in archaeology today we're, we're so over overrun with uh, with new archaeological discoveries uh, it's just difficult to um it's just difficult to get to grips with with the the pure diversity of what's out there but in many ways um because there's a great dearth of discoveries um there, there's there's the problem that we're not going to be able to understand it because there's just so much being found so i'm just going to get some of these things on the screen and uh we haven't got Andrea this week. I think she's she's come down for the meal. All right. So uh, you can see on the screen this list that we're going to do. So what we're going to do when we come to it, we're just going to click and we're going to read. Click, click, click. That's, that's what we're going to do. Um, and what, I've, what I want to do then is I want to look at this. So this is um, this is what we're looking at. That 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 there is actually a room of a building in Rutland and what you can what you can see there you can't really see it clearly right but you've got at the bottom from the bottom up you've got one two three four panels um which which describe um Homer's Iliad um at a at a villa in um in in mid mid England as it were Rutland and uh, near near Leicestershire um, and what we're going to do is, it's a quite a large site actually, they've only excavated a small amount of it. The one building that they excavated, they found some of the finest mosaics found in Britain. And when we say ever, yeah, there is an ever date, there is an ever thing on this. This is, this is by far um, some of the finest mosaics found in Britain ever, 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 ever. Yeah? And that's the problem, we use the word ever a lot because um, it, it, it's, it, it's a tag word, isn't it? Yeah. So, so that you, you, you can can you can see that now, can't you? Yes, Barry. Yeah, yeah. That is absolutely amazing. So we got we got um, in within a building. We got one panel there, two panel, three panel, four panels, right? And down at the bottom, bo down at the bottom, you've got like um, uh, like an audience chamber type thing that they, that they would have sat um, and they would have basically their children would have played and and sort of you you can imagine that. Um, um, one one of the, one of the things that I was trying to put across last week and this week about this was that was that the, there's two things that I say in archaeology. I say you can't put um, the modern mind to things in the past, right? So you can't say, for example, um, find find a building in the past and, and expect to interpret what that building means using modern ideas. It's just not going to work. But there is the, uh, there is the other side of the coin. Um, as archaeologists looked at this, the, uh, some of the archaeologists may not have known what the stories were. To be honest with you, um, I wouldn't have known what the stories were. They turned out to be from Homer's Iliad, right? So, you know, the story of Troy and um, Cassandra and um, Helen of Troy and, and so on. And um, you could be thinking, I don't know what this means. And actually, that's the same that's the same idea that somebody would have had when they entered this building if they didn't know the story themselves. So there is a point in history and archaeology where where 
the archaeological mind and the modern mind can be the same as the mind of somebody in the past. Um, so, so th this is the 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 point being made um, is that um, there is a point that um, you know there is a point of awe, i.e., oh my God, this is absolutely amazing. Um, um, you know, you, you you could you could sit there and think. Um, today this is amazing i don't understand it in the past they would have said this is amazing i don't understand it so and and the people in the past who didn't understand it the people today who don't understand it are, are using the same eyes to look at it um so you can occasionally have the same parallels of thought today as you can in the past um but that's that's not always the case, as I've already explained. You can't use modern ideas to understand the past, but there are times when your thoughts can be the same as people in the past, rightly, that you both don't understand what you're looking at. So, so that was a point I made. Um, now, what, what we do find a bit further down um, is that we've got... Um, we're, what we're going to do, we're going to we're going to zoom in, and I would like to just um, try and get some of the images, like this one up here. That 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 is, you can see you can see two chariots there, and th this is this is yeah these images coming out and and people looking at these and thinking oh my this is unbelievable you know, um, we we you can read the story and understand that this is. Um, from Homer's Iliad, and it's probably it's probably constructed in about the late 300s. A Roman villa containing a rare mosaic that depicts scenes from Homer's Iliad had been found beneath a farmer's field at Rutland near Leicestershire. Near, in Leicestershire, Leicester, um, it was discovered by complete accident by the landowner's son and investigated later on by archaeologists from the University of Leicester. Um, and it's described by many experts as one of the most remarkable and sig significant finds, wait for it, um, ever found in Britain. I can't make it up. It says ever found in Britain. And actually, as we've said, the word ever found has been overused. But on this instance, this is ever. This is this is something very, very significant. Um, and it's just recently been found. It, it's it's it's. It's unbelievably amazing um, that, that, that this is out there. Um, and again, look at the colour of the detail there. Um, and you've got the detail of the mosaic, mosaic pieces. Um, you've got blues, you've got greys, you've got um, yellows, you've got reds, you've got whites. Um, the person who owned this, this, this villa would have been somebody... Who would have been extremely wealthy um, and may, may have bumped into somebody and um, in about the 300s and they said oh look you know the existing mosaic that you've got in your villa right um, do you want it changed and the owner said yeah I've got the money I want it changed right so the mosaic maker came and said right what we'll do do you, do you know about Homer's Iliad and the landowner may not have known or already known and the landowner Goff was a native Briton um, right. And, and he, he may have had a son. It more likely would have been a son because daughters weren't really seen as relevant until about the age of seven. He may have had a son. Um, um, this is in Roman society, the Roman era. Um, what um, native people thought about their daughters was completely different from Roman fashion. But if you're gonna if you're gonna be in the Roman ilk, your your son is gonna be priority, right? Um, the eight, the days of Boudicca and, 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 and women having um, prior status in society had now gone because it's a Roman era. Anyway, I've, I've, I've muddled too much there. Anyway, so you've got a son that's going to a local um, a local school um, and your, your son would have gone to a local school in the Roman period. Your daughter wouldn't, or very unlikely, till about the age of seven. So, so your son, and he may have heard about Homer's Iliad so you can imagine the son's in the room and, and you've got the mosaic maker talking to the dad and said, dad, I know about Homer's Iliad. We've been, uh, we, we, um, um, the, the Greek, the Greek um, slave that's teaching us in, in school, right, has actually told us because the Greeks were the educators, but they were sometimes slaves teaching you, right? Um, so 
I, I've learned I've learned about Homer's Iliad. And Dad said, "Oh right, what we'll do? We'll have the mosaic about Homer's Iliad, right?" And the mosaic maker is somebody that would have had these ideas that's come over from the continent because Homer's Iliad is a is is within the Roman world, but it's it's something that would have been um, so rare to be portrayed. And this is the first time we've got the story of Homer's Iliad. And yes, we're going to use the word ever found in Britain. We've got no we've got no parallels. This story of Homer's Iliad has never been found in a mosaic in Britain at all until now. And now we've got a room um, and, and the room is, is got these panels which which have the story of Homer's Iliad spread across them, which is absolutely unbelievable. But again, back to that experience is people learning when they see the mosaic in its in its um, entirety. If the little boy's not there telling you about it, you just see all these wonderful pictures and nobody really understands what's going on. And it's the same thing that we're, we're thinking about now. It's the same thing you're thinking, what is going on, right? Um, and, we, you know, we've got the chariots and we, we, we've, we've got the story going on there and, and, and so on. And the, the people actually creating this would have been, would have been um, a school of mosaic makers from Sirencester, um, Carinium, well, obviously in Gloucestershire way. Um, and, 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 and these people had a school of uh, mosaic, makers and that style there at the bottom of the screen is actually called galosh pattern is typically of the Carinian school of mosaic makers um, in siren so we know that they we know where they came from who actually made this mosaic um and we know there's so much that we can we're learning from this just this these images from just this one panel rather than all four panels that there's, there's so much more going on um and let's just Let's just chuck this one in there. Again, look at the detail there. And so it was found by um, a chap by the name of Jim, uh, Jim Irvine, um, who was the son of um, Brian. Uh, Brian Naylor. I'm Brian and so is my dad. Anyway, um, I don't know why they got two different names, but anyway, Jim Jim Irvine, and it was found. He was wandering wandering across the field, his own land, his, his family's land, and he found some unusual pottery in the field in the lockdown in 2020. Um, contacted Leicestershire Archaeology, but before he contacted Leicestershire Archaeology, he, he did a little bit of digging, and he dug down. Um, anyway, he said that we we came down here with a spade, and I dug a shallow trench. And within uh, within just over um, half a meter, they 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 actually came across a mosaic, right? Um, and it's you know the family have been farming there for fifty to sixty years, and he didn't know didn't know anything about this. This was this was um, just over fifty meters below the surface. hadn't really been damaged. The damage on the mosaic is fire damage, which was which was caused when the when the when the building was abandoned. That's all fire damage. All, all the all the shading there is actually fire damage as beams came down from the roof um, and scorched the tiles. Some of, some of the tiles will be um, irretrievably of damage by that event because um, you know it, 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 it's 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 some of the, some the red bits are going to be um, tile Roman um, roof tile that's been reused, but lots of the other bits, for example, um, the chalk bits, for example. Um, any any other um, shades of stone and anything else that's come from from Britain or anywhere else in the Roman Empire, uh, you know, won't have been irretrievably damaged. But obviously, this is as we're looking at the mosaic now, and as it's as it's coming to light. Um, so, anyway, carry on with this article, and um, and carry on with this article. So. Um, they said that when after they had been digging, um, they saw something that um, hadn't had, had left under had left in the ground undisturbed for over one thousand seven hundred years, um, and they felt they felt that was actually absolutely amazing. Um, well, naturally, they they've got this mosaic the first time the first people to actually see this um, since the building was abandoned, um, and you know it, it's it's just. It's just these stories and, and, and the way the way they plan out. Um, you know, there, there's so much in the way of chariots and horses and chap, chap who's deceased in the corner or dead. The thing that has, has been keeping um, uh, keeping people interested is is this the state 
um, of the fines and also what's um, what could be the next thing to come up from the site? Because this is only one room that they've excavated. So that there could be many more rooms at the site that that could tell them um, a lot more about Roman society that's never been explored or understood before. Um, the mosaic, which forms the floor of what was thought to be a, um, a dining room just in this one building, um, is 11 metres in length by 7 metres wide. So it makes it a very, very large mosaic. And there's there's tens and tens of thousands of mosaic pieces in it. Um, you know, just, just looking there at the detail, you're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of mosaic. So, you know, th th there's going to be a lot of mosaic pieces. And again, the the, um, the 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 individual that commissioned this to be built, probably a man, because this is Roman era society, um, native Britain or not, you know, you're tying in with it. Um, it. It would have basically said, look, you know, no, no expense spared. And the mosaic maker would have said, oh, you know, do you fancy a bit of gold tessera? And he said, hang on, that's going a bit too far, you know. But what we do know is that some mosaics, for example, have been found in Pompeii actually have gold pieces used as tessera um, in the mosaic. He didn't get that far, right? Uh, he, was, he, he may have been a Roman standard, a millionaire, but not a billionaire, quite. So mosaics were regularly used in private and public buildings across the Roman Empire, and often featured famous figures from mythology. But not always. Some mosaics are quite plain. Some might actually might be monochrome, just black and white. Some might just be, um, you know, um, shapes, um, you know, square shapes, circular shapes, no, no figures to it at all. No, no um, animization to it. Right. No figures, no nothing. Some might portray images of family members. Others might portray the seasons. But in this case, portraying famous figures from mythology. The Rutland mosaic is thought to be unique in the UK, um, UK as it features Achilles um, at battle um, with Hector at the conclusion of the Trojan War. So if we if we go with this, um, the one that actually shows Achilles and Hector is the one that we, we saw initially. Hang on, if we can get Achilles. Right, yes, there's Achilles on the left. Hang on. Oh God, I just I just had it. Hang on. There, there's 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 um there's there's son and, and, and dad, um uh, Jim and, and Brian, and uh, there they are cleaning it clean it up. So you can get to close to this. Um as they're slowly cleaning it up, you can get a little bit of a shoe coming in there. And the person who created this mosaic decided to go into the panel decided to go into the panel as well. The design runs into the panel, which is fine. Um Again, that gives you an idea of the scale um, as it's at all being cleaned up with the four panels and, and the, the end sort of panel there. Um, again, it just gives you an idea of the great scale of this room. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the, this, this thing that um, the mosaic had been damaged in, in fire is, is part of the history and archaeology of it. We, we know the end game for this site. There's just so many beautiful images up here. Actually, some not from the site. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to find the one that I wanted to um, show. Um, I just had it. Uh, there we go. Yeah, there they, they you've got Achilles from the story of Homer's Iliad. And you've got Hector battling on two char chariots outside the walls of um, Troy. This, this is the story. Well, one of the stories of Homer's Iliad. Uh, part, uh, part of the conclusion of the Trojan War, where, they, where they're battling. So, so what we do know is that the villa, um, the villa um, was found. Um, they're, they're, they're obviously been working on it. They're not giving away the exact location. It's been what what's happened. They've they've um, it's now a scheduled ancient monument. It's, so it's protected. It's in farmland, so they can't keep an eye on it all the time. So what they've done, they've covered it back up because the landowners need to know what they're going to do with it. I tell you what, right? Um, if if I if I owned this, I, I would just I would just pack in farming and just this would be my income. But that's me, you know. I'm not a, I'm not a farmer. Well, I've I've got I've got a lot of animals at this minute, and um, I, I I'm 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 technically half a farmer now. Um, 
but um, if I had something like this, this, this would be my income and the farming would you'd be around the outside. You'd have a regular income with this. And even in lockdowns and stuff, you could sort of do online stuff. It's great. So um, the, the land, the land itself, they don't want anyone visiting the site at this minute because they need to know what, what to finally do with it. Um, for now, the mosaic has been covered back up and it's under um, 0.6 meters of, of soil. And it's it, there's a membrane on it, so it's not going to come to any harm. Um, and they really hope um, that people will be able to come to visit um, in situ one day. But decisions about its long term future haven't been made. I tell you what, Garth, right? This it would be for me, it would be heinous to remove this and put it in the British Museum. It would just be not. You know, I would want to see it in the field. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's in context. That it's in it's in the original building within the setting of the landscape. You know, even though the landscape's changed, I went into I went into Hereford Muse, uh, Museum and um, if you've got like Hereford Museum and Gallery, and there's a library there opposite the cathedral. And you go in there to see a mosaic, and it's just hanging on the wall. It's like it's like um, it's vertically on the wall, and you're thinking, right. Yeah, nice. And there's varnish all over it. And you're thinking, well, all right, fair enough. And the problem is it doesn't do anything for you. This does because it, it's there. It, it's it's you're you're using the same. And the other thing as well is if you lift the thing, you've got to um, um, it's almost as if you've got to partly destroy it to move it. No, let's just not move it. Let's just keep it there. And 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 tell you off if this if this was found um if, if this was found in, in China, which it wouldn't be because it's Roman, but you know what I'm saying, there would be, there would be a huge aircraft hangar with, with um, 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 you know, people would be able to look at it now. And, and, and that, you know, that, that's the thing. So, um, so the site is so big that only a tiny part of the, um, this site have actually been excavated. And investigations have revealed, um, and, and trial excavations and other survey work have revealed there's barns, circular structures, bathhouses, all sorts of things. The complex is likely to have been occupied by someone who was extremely wealthy, maybe with a knowledge of classical literature. There's not necessarily. Um, sometime in the early part of the 300s. Um, um, and again, if we sort of, do you know what, what I'm going to do? I'm going to, um, I've got my article in front of me and I don't know what I'm afraid of. I just want to, I want to go to the article that I'm actually looking at because there's there's a little bit more in the article and um, I think I'll just need to show you what I've got in front of me um, because there's, there's so much more that I'm seeing. Hang on, this one. Just look, look at the images and scroll down. Um, there, and the one thing as well is, uh, this is a rather interesting point. It's, it's, it's quite, um, there, there's th that that chap there, he's, he's a, a mosaic expert and, um, I've spoken to him a couple of times on the phone and um, oh, I think his name is Kosh. I can't remember exactly. But anyway, anyway, that chap there, it illustrates the fact that, that um, you've got somebody that's actually um, drawing what you're seeing in front of you, which you're not going to replicate with a camera. Right. So we're still drawing things in archaeology because um, even though cameras are great, cameras don't always replicate everything you see um so this this is what we've got um and again sort of being there understanding that there they are jim and his uh, dad brian um jim and brian and there, there we go giving you an idea of the detail some mosaic pieces on the edge are really bad you've got the galosh there bit really bad i didn't say it. i didn't mean that really large really bad really large that that's some of the local limestone um and then you've got the galosh here where you've got bits of tile probably from the cotswolds you've got some of the the, the whiter uh, paler stone and then you go into the panels and um, that gives you an idea again that down here you've got um this building um rectangular like building with hexagonal apsidal there and you've got all these all these rooms here, um, all these bits of building. Um, and there it is, look at the detail there, the, the way the detail is showing and the way that the, the detail um, is almost not being impinged by the way it's being laid out. Basically the, 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 um, 
the mosaic maker said, you know, this galosh line in the middle and the border, let's just let's just stretch it. So it looks make, makes it stretch and it looks really good. So 17 meter length of mosaic here. Um, a- absolutely, absolutely unbelievable and amazing. Um, and I, I would go with the, this following statement from an archaeologist from Leicester University. This is certainly the most exciting Roman mosaic discovery in the UK. Um, you know, in in over the past hundred years at least, I would say one of the finest. We've got the the Woodchester find dating back to the eighteen hundreds, and we've obviously got the wonderful mosaics that have been found at Fishbourne Roman Palace. Now, this could actually be a palace itself. There could be more, many more mosaics here, and if that's the case, this could be by far the the finest. Roman villa found in Britain to date, but then again, this is only this has only been found in the last year, Goff. So there could be many more. This is new. This is completely new. We 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 didn't know this has existed. This is um, um, on the nail. So this this so again, again looking down at this and thinking <clears throat> how much more there could be, um, and. But what we'll do, we'll just we'll just go back and now. I've just shown you that, and I'm going to give you give us one more image about this, and just uh, um, let's just have one more image somewhere. Um, let's just see if we can. Yeah, there there it is in its in its true entirety. There, you're reading that. It looks great. Um, now it gives us fresh perspectives on the attitudes of people at the time. They're links to classical literature, and it also tells us an enorm- enormous amount about the individual who commissioned the piece. You know, this this is somebody that um, that had incredible wealth. Uh, this is someone with the knowledge of the classics, maybe who had the money to commission a piece of such detail, definitely. And it is the very de- first depiction of the stories that have ever been found in Britain. Yes, definitely that. Um, and chief executive of, of um, the historic English, the old English heritage, said to have uncovered such a rare mosaic of this side as well as surrounding villa is remarkable. Discoveries like this are so important in helping us piece together our shared history. By protecting this site, we are able to continue learning from it and look forward to what future excavations may teach us about the people who lived there over 1,500 years ago. The site is on private land and not accessible to the public. More excavations in 2022. And there is going to be Digging for Britain, um, a new series in the new year, and which will feature this site. So, um, again, I think that's that's amazing that we got the stories. And just that, that one thing there, you've got Achilles, um, and he's weighing um, life against gold. Um, and then you've got... You've got the whole portrayal of of the end part of um, this 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 war, and rather interesting to see what what is actually under the fourth panel there, which which I cannot make out. There is something underneath that staining. There is some kind of a figure there um, in the middle in in this last panel, but I just cannot make it out. Um, and maybe when we do see digging for Britain on on TV, and again, what what's happened? Just a little bit of an explanation. When when the villa itself was was um, uh, at the last day of the villa, um, there was a tremendous fire, um, and that tremendous fire, the, the timbers fell from the roof and and they they gathered on the floor, um, and it, it's basically um, it totally discolored some of the scenes there, um, and this is what's happening and. Um, the, the fire was so intense that some of the mosaic pieces um, were disinherited from from what you're looking at. But I'm sure we can really understand a lot more what's what's there um, at that panel there. If we can put probably put some of that together, but we'll we'll, we'll just see. So that that's that that's that little bit today. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop screen sharing now and. Um, what before we go on to um, before we go right? So the next bit is going to be me asking you what you feel is the greatest discovery ever made in archaeology, right? Then we're going to go through that list of ten great discoveries made um, in two thousand twenty-one, 
And then the last bit, um, I'm going to ask you what is the um, what is your most famous lecture that you've done over the last year? But we'll do the famous lecture thing. You can you can think about that in your your, your mind there, Goff. I, I I've got a feeling I might know what it is, but then again, I could be completely wrong. Um, I got two in my head, and um, two in my head, which which were mentioned. There was um, no, I got uh, yeah, but we. I'm not going to ask you that there. Um, but what I want to know is what you feel. And, and give me a reason why what you feel is the um, the greatest archaeological discovery ever made. What what not your not your favourite, but the greatest archaeological discovery ever made. Oh, I I, I suppose I'd have to say uh, Egyptian Valley of the Kings. Uh, yeah. Um, can you can you possibly tell me? Um, is this? Are you talking about? Seti the Seti the the great tomb. Or are we talking about? Yeah, yeah. That, that's tomb. right. You're, you're talking about that area. So no, that's yeah. uh, weirdly enough, nobody mentioned that at all. Nobody, nobody oh. mentioned. Uh, nobody mentioned that at all. Um, it's a difficult question because um, um, if I, if I found an old Roman pot in my garden, as far as I'm concerned, that would be the greatest archaeological find ever. Um, but for a, a, an archaeological find that changes people's um, uh, knowledge of uh, of archaeology and life of those in various times in the world, um, yeah, I, I would say something as monumental as the Egyptian finds. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I agree. I agree. So it's a personal thing. Yes. Uh, but I recognise. There have been so many great discoveries, aren't there? Like, like in South America and Egypt, and uh, you know, it's um, yeah. You know, I mean, the mosaic we're talking about, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, no, no, it 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 is massively fantastic, massively fantastic. So um, I, I'm thinking that what what we'll do now, um, and I'm probably thinking that we'll. Um, this is going to be a, a shorter class today that, than than we've that had. That works for me. Yeah, yeah. I think think it works for both of us. What, what, what I'm going to do after this, I'm going to um, um, I, I've got I've got a few things to do outside, and I'm trying I'm trying out a um, a rammed path um, that you that you get um, odd shaped stones that we're finding, and you just um, um, a lump hammer and you bang the yeah. things into the mud, and it's just going to see if that works. Yeah, good. But one thing about the mosaic, you didn't give a time, a date for it. When right. It, when it was. Yeah. In, 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 interestingly enough, <clears throat> um, in, interestingly enough, what, what, what we're seeing um, is, I tell you what, if we, if we go, um, th there's a clue. I, I, I've been thinking this. I'm not exactly sure, right? But there is a clue. Right? There's no date being given, but I, I've I've got a little idea to the. Uh, it, it's saying it's the, about the three hundreds to maybe about three fifty, right? Um, and I, I I'm going to see if I can hone in on this, right? Now, um, there there is there is a sense of. Um, even though this is extremely fine, there's a sense of lack of perspective with some of it. It almost looks as if it's 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 too British, right? It, it's not like some of the very fine ones I've seen from from Cyprus, or it's not like some of the fine ones I've seen elsewhere from earlier on in the Roman period. So I, I would say it's closer to the later part of the Roman era in Britain probably more towards the 400s rather than um, the 200s because earlier mosaics in, in Britain were um, they, they were a little bit, little bit more addressed they, they were less flowy this is somebody that's, uh, that's sort of being given carte blanche and allowed to just flow right <coughs> so um, and, and if I if I type in here we, we, we've got um, got a nice little question there 
at Chedworth, if you can remember a few, quite some months ago, they, they found, um, they, they, they excavated a, a mosaic at Chedworth, which was extremely late. Uh, here we go, this one here. My, and they basically said about this one, this is into the, um, this is probably about um, 410, 420, right? And what you can, if we can get some of the images, um, hang on a minute, let's just try and, do you know what? It's, it, whoever wrote this is a gobshite because we just got loads of bloody writing and we, we need to get a bit more images. Um, right, if we... Uh, Right. If if we if we look, you know that that design is very similar to what we said. Did you, did you see the galosh there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keep, yeah. Keep that in your mind. Right. What we're going to do? We're going to open another window. Right. And I'm going to. Um, here we go. I'm going to type that in there. And the the, the similarity of the similarity of that galosh. Come on, come on, stop messing me around. Um, the, the similar, the similarity, it's, it's, it's almost a, a crude sharpness. Um, hang on, we'll just uh, see if we can get some of that in there. Yeah, you, 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 see, you see that there, right? Mm -hmm. See that design there, if you keep that in your mind's <coughs> eye, just keep that in your mind's eye. If we then go to the other image, and we then look at that, you can see there's sort of a similarity. Um, that that's the that the other one which we looked at is single galosh. This is this is double galosh. But it's almost as if the colours are very similar to the one we've looked at. And I would say that the 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 Rutland mosaic is, is probably around the same period as this, but they're not saying. If it turns out that this is a Roman villa that dates to the um let me get my words out. If this is a Roman villa that dates to um, the early 400s, it's as significant as this design at Chedworth. Um, and it tells us that, um, again, something I've been saying for a long time, Goff, Roman civilization did not end in Britain in 410 or 420. It just went on and on and on until the ends of the day. Well, that's a really interesting question there. I, I, um, it was very vague, but my answer is it's more later Roman Britain than earlier. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm with that. I'm definite on that one. Right. So what um, I should have, I should have stayed on the, I should have stayed on the share screen to be honest with you, because I've got to go back to it. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back again um, because I may as well, we may as well go through this journey together because I chose to do this today. This is some, this is not what we did on, this is not what we did on, Tuesday. Tuesday was like discoveries over the years and and and, and um, what it is is the discoveries from um, this year, 2021. So we may as well just go through go through this discovery together. Here we go. So we we've had, we've had I, I didn't I didn't what we've got we've got so uh, we've got Luxor there which is which is the the site that we did last week. We've got the world's first artists from Tibet. So we've got um, one from Asia so far, and we've got one from Africa. Interesting. We've got another from Morocco there, earliest leather work. And now we've got one from North America, right? We've got one from North America at, at White Sands um, in North, uh, North America, New Mexico, right? So then we go back to... Um, um, Asia again, Saudi, Saudi Arabia. And we've got one in Europe. We've got, um, we've got this Bronze Age map from Europe there. So we've got the oldest animals from northern Saudi Arabia. There we go, the carvings, carvings of them in the rock. And we've got this one in Europe. Um, and now we've got a rare boundary marker from early Rome, uh, found in Italy. Now this, that's, that's, that's going to be of interest to anyone interested in their Romans. Back to North America, Goff. We got um, when the Vikings crossed the Atlantic, Newfoundland. Um, we've got to go to one in the Mediterranean. Crusaders mass grave found at Sidon, Le Lebanon. And then 
typically in this list written by an American, you've got a slave tag from Charleston, South Carolina, which is really very relevant. But Goff, this is not um, this is not a top ten. This is top ten discoveries. This isn't this isn't like top ten of the greatest discoveries ever made. So what we're going to do, we're just going to um, we're just going to scratch and sniff. We're going to do one that we did last week. This is um, this is um, Luxor. This this uh, this actually hasn't been published yet. So a separate this 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 we we were we were in awe about this last week. I definitely was. Everyone. Evan that, that did this with me last week. A settlement that was buried beneath the sands for thousands of years and eluded archaeologists for centuries is believed to be one of the largest ancient Egyptian cities ever unearthed. And we said that last week, again, another ever. The site was discovered by a stroke of good luck when archaeologists began searching um, for the mortuary temple of the boy pharaoh Tutankhamun along the west bank of the Nile in Luxor. What they found instead was a well-preserved urban settlement filled with houses, streets and walls, some of which still stand to 10 feet tall. Again, that was amazing last week. Hieroglyphic inscriptions indicate that the city was called um, Artem, or the Dazzling Artem, and that it was founded by Tutankhamun's grand, um, grandfather, Amenhotep III, and we already worked this out that um, Tutankhamun um, and the son of Anamhotep was um, Akhenaten himself. Um, I call this the Golden City because it dates the reign of Amenhotep III, which was a golden age of ancient Egypt. Zawi Hawass said, Zaw this is going to be, Zawi Hawass has actually made it now. This, this Egyptian archaeologist, he's made it to the status of Howard Carter. Howard Carter finds, as, as, as you mentioned just then, Goff, the, the um, tomb um, in the Valley of the Kings, um, very nearby. Zawi Hawass makes the, the, the finest discovery of um, a, a city for normal people ever made in Egypt. So, you know, this, this guy now goes out there. Um, so there we go. Beautiful image there. Uh, Artem was Egypt's main administrative and industrial center. The city's remarkable state of preservation um, is providing researchers with an unprecedented view of life there more than 3,000 years ago. Although only about one third of the site has been excavated, probably a lot less than that, thus far archaeologists have uncovered houses containing everyday objects, including ceramic vessels, didn't mention this last week, children's dolls and limestone gaming pieces. Again, we didn't mention any of this last week. Um, what else have we got? Uh, they have also identified bakeries, kitchens and other areas associated with food production, as well as a vessel containing more than 20 pounds of dried meat prepped by a butcher named Louis. Um, there are also workshops that produced mud bricks and decorative amulets and a residential and administrative neighborhood that was encircled by distinctive zigzag walls. Scholars do not yet understand why Artem fell into decline. We mentioned this last week, but it, uh, it may have been abandoned by Amenhotep III's son, Arkan Artem, who moved the Egyptian capital from Luxor to Amarna, 250 miles away and um, we got the likes of Tutankhamun, who then goes back to the city, um, who, who uses it for a sh short period of time. So, you know, that's what we did last week. Um, that, that's of the 10. So um, I do know that um, the, these other ones that we're going to look at um, uh, will just give us an overview, which is where we want to be. I just got to take a note of something. And one of the things that I noticed last week was the way the, the Egyptians were working on the city in Luxor. They, they were restoring the archaeology as they went around, including the artifacts. So instead of having a boxes of artifacts in museums needing to stick, stick them together, they were sticking them together in the archaeology there and then. So when they lifted them, you've got a complete pot. And I thought that was absolutely unbelievable. And do you know what? When I'm excavating archaeological sites again, um, any artifacts that we find that... that, uh, that match we're just going to be gluing them in in situ um instead of having trays and trays full of pottery that we've got to stick together which we never stick together because we've got not got time so if you put them together in the ground that's the way to do it I'm i've learned a lot from the egyptians in the way they've worked on this site i really have 
is something that we don't do in British archaeology, it's something I'll certainly do. Right, there, so this find itself, I've not come across this. Um, this is known as um, Kaisan, Hot Spring Tibet. Um, and you've got rock art, look at that there. I, I didn't know this. So there we go. You've got this carved into um, the rock there. And that's what they're seeing um, from the imagery of the rock art. And what they're showing is that there's various different layers of rock art there. there there's, there's, you've got footprints, you've got hands being carved into the rock. Love it, love it. Never knew this. Uh, the world's earliest rock art may have been made by two creative children who lived in Tibet. Oh my God, I had no idea of the dates of this. No, that can't be true. No, that, that can't be right. This is rock art that dates to a um, quarter of a million years ago. Okay, I'm going to have to go with it. The young art, yeah, all right, Dan, I'm going to have to go with that. I'm just, um, I'm not, I didn't know this. Um, created 226,000, 226,000 to 169,000 years ago. Start trying to get those dates out. The young artists, probably either Neanderthals or members of a Denisovian species, left a series of closely grouped handprints and footprints on an outcrop of a type of limestone called travertine. Travertine, which builds up um, around mineral springs, is initially soft enough to hold impressions. These can eventually harden after the spring changes course. Other ancient prints have been found preserved in travertine near the hot spring where the children's prints were discovered. The local people associate them with the Buddha, but they were puzzled by these prints because they are so small. Um, are, we, are we actually talking about them being carved into the rock or actually the actual? No, it looks like they are carved in, I don't know. Well, whatever, however this is being created, right? However this is being created, this is unbelievable. Um, it says that the, the team excavating there, Hang, um, the archaeologist said, they used uranium series dating. So th this is the t uh, this is a very highly advanced, um, expensive form of dating that they're using, um, which examines trace amounts of uranium and thorium in calcium carbonate deposits, such as travertine, to determine when the prints were left on the outcrop's uh, surface. Since uranium decays to... Um, to thorium at a known rate. So obviously everything like uranium, um, carbon C4, which is in the human body, over a period of time, it decays. So there's less and less of it. So there's less and less uranium somewhere. There's less and less carbon 14. And as it decays and breaks down, you can work out the process of time. So you can work out that there's X amount of uranium in, in something when it's created if it's been in the ground for a long period of time, if it's half the level of uranium that it should be, that gives you a date. Same with carbon-14. Um, I was shocked by the date. No, 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 no. I'm shocked by the date as well. They are so early and there is no utilitarian explanation for how they are grouped together. They had to have been deliberately composed. So it's art. Hang acknowledges that some might consider the prints childish doodles rather than true art. All oh, right, these are created. These are actually created. Wow, what is play and what is art? We think these prints are both. Well, that's actually quite shocking. I, I could have done a whole two hour lecture on that. Um, that that's actually quite shocking. I, I had no idea of that. I'm, I'm blown away by that one. That That is quite there, right? Very much there. Um, God, I, I, I'm going to do one more. Um, this, this, this is bleeding me. This is because I, I, I didn't know this. This is one from Morocco. Oh, look how deep they're going in Morocco with those excavations. The, 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 well, yeah, OK. This is a new way of doing archaeology, Goff. Build steps down to the archaeology. I love it. I'm loving all this. I really am. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Um, I, again, I've not seen this. I, I, I'm, I'm loving this one. I really am. While sorting through some 12,000 12, bone fragments excavated um, in a cave, um, Cotra Bandia's cave, um, the Atlantic coast of Morocco, um, from the Max Planck Institute. There you go again. They, 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 you see the ice man eat your heart out. Notice that some were smooth and shiny. 
<coughs> right, so um, some of the bones were smooth and shiny, intentionally shaped by human hands. So what, where are we now? Um, we've got leather workers, earliest leather workers, right? Just keep, keep focused on this a minute. Um, upon consultation with colleagues, she determined that 62 of the fragments are bone tools. They've got bone tools dating again to a whopping 120,000 years ago. Do you know what? We're taking these dates back so far that I, I think everything that we were saying two years ago is wrong. I've always said this about archaeology, that eventually we're going to get to the point that things are going to turn out to be so incredibly old that the, the, all the ideas about human origins um, were wrong. And, and, and we're getting there. When we did, uh, when we did the, Australians, um, uh, the Australian Aboriginals, uh, we were talking about people getting to Australia thousands, tens of thousands of years before we ever thought, 100,000 years or more. We thought, how did they get there and all the rest of it? And why, why not? Um, and here we go. These include a number of tools made from animal rib bones of a type well known for its use in fur and leather working. Once you have an animal skin, there are lots of steps that have to be taken to process it to, to make it supple, smooth and ready to wear. These tools remove the collective tissues and fats from the skin without piercing or damaging it. The archaeologist said the identified bones of carnivores such as sand foxes, golden jackals and wildcats that, have, that, that had marks indicating they had been skinned for their hides or fur, right, into the bone. Okay, so you've got evidence in the bone that they've been butchered to use um, the, the hides for um, skin using and sometimes bones that are close to the hide have to be removed in a certain way, way indicating evidence of the tools that were used on them. Love it. Together, the carnivore bones and bone tools appear to provide the earliest known evidence of people making clothes. This fits well with previous genetic studies of clothing lice that suggest clothing was first worn by humans up to 170,000 years ago. And why not? Um, um, so I don't think you and Eleanor would be um, happy wandering around naked at Christmas um, dinner, would you? So obviously you're going to be wearing your clothes. Um, the archaeologist said um, it's possible that people at Contrabanders Cave produce leather to string small beads together to make symbolic personal ornaments, pierced shells from the snail genus um, Nasarius, dating to around the same time as the bones have also been found in the cave. Do you know when I opened this, I actually thought that that, that could actually be leather but that's actually marked on those are um that's a bone tool with marks on it that's what that is rather than the leather itself but obviously we've got ev evidence of leather working there um right Goff, what we're going to do we're going to we're going to we're going to take we're going to take that as our break right so have you got any questions and i hope you're i hope you're thinking about your um your favorite lecture but you're not going to tell me yet so um yeah no, no question no questions, right? Okay, we'll have a very short break then. There's only two of us, so we'll um, we'll, we'll break for just five minutes and we'll come back, okay? Okay. <coughs> a cup of tea, yeah. Oh, uh, cup of tea, cup of tea. <coughs> uh, starry, starry night. Paint your palace, blue and palace. Palette, palace. Mm -hmm.
This is Paint your palette blue and gray. Look out on a summer's day. Starry Vincent shines of starry blue. Shadow on you. Listening comes of amber gray. Mm. Empty. Oh, it is empty. Let's get that first step out. I'm waiting for my tea to do. So what you got planned for Christmas Day, uh, Lovely? We're going to uh, Eleanor's daughter's in Cardiff. Oh, so it's not, I, I thought it was just going to be, I just thought it was going to just be the two of you. It was, but um, plans have changed. <clears throat> my eldest daughter's coming to visit me on the weekend, which is why I'm so cautious. Uh, no, so... Oh, right. Coming down from Yorkshire. Oh, right. What does Eleanor feel about that? Oh, it's okay. Her son's coming from Norfolk as well to her. Oh, no, what I'm, what I, no, what I don't mean about the relations with the family. I'm on a, talking about the, the movement of people, you know? Oh, that one flows. Right, okay. It's just, 
a mitigation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can't have it all. Well, I, I don't know whether it's... Well, I just don't know. I'm just trying to go along with the flow. To be honest. I really don't know what to think of it all. Uh, just... <laughs> And then I don't think the government does either. Completely right there. Went to the cinema last week twice. Well, I'll go tell, tell me about that experience. Well, it, when both both occasions we went in the afternoon. There was no one there. We're the only ones in the cinema. Believe it or not. Oh. At Twelve o'clock we went. Anyway, we went to see um, the Bond movie, which was shite. Oh, how was it? Shite. Oh. Same old, same old. Uh, yeah, one very good. Seen better. <clears throat> and we went to see uh, West Side Story, which is absolutely fantastic. Where did you... You saw that in Cardiff, did you? No, in Bridgend. Oh, oh the, the, the film West Side Story. It's a new film by Spielberg. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It really was a good film. Yeah. Maria! That's oh, right. That's a girl called Maria! La 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 la. La 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 la. So we have been uh, venturing out, but being very careful. Can I just ask you so, did you have to do all the stupid tests? No, you just need your vaccination certificate and wear the mask. And they gave the, the certificate a cursory uh, look and uh, went in. And because there was no one in the cinema, honestly true, no one else except us, we took our masks off. Well, to, to, be, yeah. to be honest with you, I've got to be honest with you, um, why would you keep them on if there was no one else in the cinema? Use your common sense. Yeah, exactly. Use your common sense, exactly. But the previous week, we went to see June. I don't know if you're interested in science fiction. Oh, the, 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 not the original film, Dune. No, no, this is the, the new, the latest version, Dune. Right. My hurt. Yeah, and that was absolutely uh, you know, amazing. Yeah, if you like that genre, you know, very, very good. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty minded about what I watch. I don't mind, you know. It's, um, yeah. I like the cinema. I like the. I like going in the back back row, you know. Yeah, but you wouldn't go in a back row with Jim. <laughs> poor yeah. old Jim. Yeah, I, 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 I think poor old Jim exactly. I just, uh, you know, it's well, just uh, when when I see when I met Jim, I thought, who is he? I mean. What is this person all about? I mean, where did we, how did we come across this chap? You know, it's weird. <laughs> I mean, I could get the likes of Peter, Pete. You could see Pete. He is where he is. Even little Steve, you know, uh, and the ladies, you know. But Jim, he's like, a, wow, where did he come from? Who produced him? What's he all about? I, I, I've never been able to work this one out. He's, he's um, um, he's, he's worked, he's worked as a photograph photographer in a museum, and I don't know anything more. Well, you'd give a two-hour lecture, and at the end, you'd say any questions. He'd ask a completely obscure question about nothing to do with. What you've just been talking about, and I think, what the fuck is that? What's <laughs> amazing? So immediately turns me off that sort of personality. You know, it's although I nothing against the guy, he doesn't do any harm to me. But yeah. can you remember? Yeah. Can you remember the time that sort of drunken bloke turned up? He, he was there in the right hand corner, the one who, who's got a couple of problems, and he, he's got a brother that lives there. And he, um, I think oh, he was, yeah, yeah, spooky. I, I, what's that? Spooky, 
Yeah, and and he and he and and and, um, and he refused to pay. <laughs> and, and and I think it was you or somebody said, "Oh, you know, we're not we're not happy with freeloaders." <laughs> Yeah, don't get something for nothing. My boss told me, you know, knowledge is money. Knowledge is money. Yeah, yeah, you've got to pay for knowledge. Just doesn't doesn't come free. Information is is expensive these days. Yeah, it it is, it is, it is, it is. I mean, the 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 the, the Chinese pay good money for state secrets. Just a minute, I've got, I've got, because the chap, the chap's going to work in my kitchen. So can we make the next session a bit shorter? Yeah. Okay. We'll get started now. You've got to go and see him. Yeah. Yeah. Just in the middle of the Zoom meeting. So go ahead. Yes, Howard. You know Howard. I'll, I'll probably come across Howard. Yeah, he's going to do a little job for me in the kitchen. It's a bit early, but never mind. Go ahead. Work, workmen who come early, you know they're going to get the job done, don't you? Yeah, sorry. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, that 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 that's really good. Right, okay, let's let's crack on with it. Let's just get back with this list. Um, oh God, let's just uh, get my my head around i've i've just been i've just been given notification that uh um romans in south wales has, has sold out of another bookshop and we just can't restock it's fantastic which, which is it's it, 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 it's it's good to be in a place that you've got a book that's a complete sellout but uh it's really disappointing you can't sell it anymore so so we're we're actually going to go for a reprint so are you there? Yeah. So um, so the next the next one we're going to look at is White Sands in New Mexico. Now, if I can remember White Sands, I think that in New Mexico, that's a place that they've done atomic testing, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. So any, anyway, White Sands in New Mexico, you've got these footprints here. Um, and obviously these are genuine footprints rather than the carved ones that we've already seen that, that – uh, Oh, there, there, there are tens of thousands of years earlier than this. Um, but here we go. Over the past over the past two decades, archaeologists have discovered a number of sites that show that people first arrived in the Americas as early as sixteen thousand years ago. I remember we were doing that lecture, and we come up with a conclusion that was a lot earlier than that. Some scholars have explored sites that have yielded even earlier dates, but other researchers have questioned the legitimacy of the discoveries. Well, they would. Argue that artifacts recovered from them are not um, unambiguously the work of human hands. Now, radio car. So basically, what we're talking about, they found evidence of fires in caves and stuff. And they said, "Oh well, is this a natural fire or is this a fire that humans made?" And you know, and they, they've got broken bits of flint. Is that flint naturally there, or was it um, done by a fire? Anyway. When you get something like this, it says now radiocarbon dating of materials associated with fossilized human footprints at White Sands National Park has shown that people were living in North America up to 23,000 years ago. The prints are parts of hundreds of fossilized prints of actual humans dating back to 23,000 years ago. Trackways archaeologists have found at the park left in mud surfaces surrounding an extinct lake. A team from local universities, Cornell University, said uh, they identified a series of such trackways left by mainly by teenagers and young children that uh, were superimposed on top of each other over the course of millennia. So, in other words, people were making um, when, when the mud itself was wet, they were wandered across it. It dried out, preserving the print and then mud created over that. And then you've got another print over that. I love it. I love the way we're looking at this radiocarbon dating of aquatic plant seeds found below and above. Um, uh, these trackways show that they were created between 23 and 21,000 years ago. Scholars can question whether a stone or human artifact was actually shaped by humans, but a footprint, but there's no mistake in who made a human footprint. Now we're now halfway through the list. This is, this is a, this is a place that we don't often go to 
Oh my god, these are huge. Are they are they that size? My god, look at the size of that. That's a camel. It's a camel carved in rock. 12 panels. Ama amazing. Now that, that so surely they've known about this before. It can't just be a new discovery, but it looks like it is. Right, I'm just gonna pour pour some milk into my my wonderful tea here. So um 12 panels depicting images of camels and wild donkeys are now are now known to be the oldest life-size, life-size, that's why they're so huge, a life-size animal reliefs in the world. By using techniques such as analyzing tool marks and erosion, as well as carbon, radiocarbon dating. Um, so you've got a camel there um, dating to 5,000 years ago. Um, Oh uh, no, here we go. Um site no not five. Oh no, I've done that wrong. Site um to the middle of around five thousand years BC. But right, okay. Um some five thousand years earlier than originally thought. So these these are seven thousand years old. Amazing. Um and we're talking about the camels there. So an indication we've got camels um also being carved by humans. So northern Africa was much wetter than it is now, and no Mads herded sheep, cattle, and goats and hunted abundant wildlife. Animals would have had a crucial role in the herders' existence, which may help um, explain why they created massive reliefs. Um, it said that uh, explains that the site was clearly used for centuries. Um, and new reliefs like these, I can't I can't understand how something like this hasn't been spotted before. I wonder if the site was visited regularly, but uh, reliefs were only added on special occasions. Or was it only visited for special occasions when new reliefs were added um, or existing ones repaired? Neolithic artists 7,000 years ago who worked high atop cliffs um, where they would never have been able to see the entire animals while carving it. The level of naturalism and detail is astonishing and the technique and skill community effort involved in the creation of these reliefs is evidence of the importance of rock art in the social and um, symbolic life of Neolithic herders of North Africa. So in other words, you can see it from a distance, but not close up, a bit like the Nazca lines. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so here we go. Um, number six. Now they're saying this is a map. Right. Um, the saying this is a map. This is what we've got here. Um, that's looking like it's a map because a seven, seven and five foot slab. So it's quite a big slab. Um, carves repeated Moses linked by a network, right? so, um, a network of lines. They suspect it might be some sort of map. The slab was actually excavated um, in 1900 from a barrow in Brittany which formed part of an um, early Bronze Age tomb dating back 3,640 um, um, years ago. So 3,640. The artifact, which weighs more than a tonne, has been in storage and nobody's looked at it. Amazingly, they're only looking at it now. Oh, great. It's been in, it's been in a museum for like 120 years. The archaeologists recognised that a triangular hollow at the slab's left edge resembled the shape um, of a valley. Uh, where it was discovered, um, a square motif in this hollow appears to represent a, um, a prominent granite ma mass in the landscape. Likewise, the lines in the slab closely match the river's uh, the area's uh, river network, and it's saying that uh, the slab um, is a map of an area measuring 19 miles by 13 miles. This is the oldest map of a territory that we can recognise in Europe. I'd love to have done more about this. It's just just mentioning it really. Motive in the center of the slab may mark an enclosure leading. The researchers suggest the map depicts the realm of a small Bronze Age kingdom and that its purpose was to stake a claim to its territory. So if we, if we look at that, it says um, a hollow at the slab's left edge. Um, so if we look there, hollow. So they're saying that this represents a valley and you've got these lines and why not? You know, they, they, they needed maps like us. Uh, we'd, we'd need a whole class on this. I've got to be honest with you, Goff, but it's definitely a wonderful find there. Yeah. But it's been, it's been in a museum again. It's one of those finds that's been in a museum for a very, very long time and not looked at. So we couldn't do this list without a Roman find. Um, we've already done a Roman find today, but um, now this is, there we go. Really clear um, carving. Really nice and clear that. 
uh, rare, a rare stone that demarcated the boundary of ancient Rome's sacred precinct was unearthed by workers rene renovating the city's sewer system. The six foot tall limestone block, you couldn't have missed that, was found embedded in the ground where it was placed <coughs> almost a thousand years ago and is one of only 10 of its kind ever discovered. The marker, which is known as a kipus, was one of dozens that were installed around the city to mark the pomerium, um, a, um, a hallowed zone where activities were um, dictated by a strict set of rules. For example, one could, own, could be buried, for example, no one could be buried within the limits and crossing the boundary bearing arms was for, forbidden. That was the old thing about parts of Rome. The symbolic barrier was the border between Rome proper and the urbis and its outlying territories. The agron separated religious activities from civic and a military life. So the agar is basically the demarcation between one zone and another. The pomerium was periodically expanded as Rome grew. Uh, Roman legend holds that Romulus, the city's mythical founder, um, in the year 753 years BC, about, uh, created a settlement. Um, an inscription on the newly discovered keepus indicates it was erected in the reign of Emperor um, Claudius, AD 49, um, significantly redrew the city's limits. So it, these, these are marker posts indicating the size of Rome. Yes, significant understanding uh, the area of Rome um, and part of that sense of history that we all um, look at from time to time. So um, I'm just going to turn my other computer off because I, I actually don't need it at this minute. Um, so here we go. Vikings crossed the Atlantic. Hang on. The Vikings crossed the Atlantic. Here we go. In Newfoundland, we're into Canada. Um, oh, lots of nice finds there. So um, wood samples from a Viking site for dating. Um, it goes on to say, when a settlement in Lask of um, La Haute or Meadow, uh, which is a well-known um, sort of influenced Viking site, there it is. You can see the um, the outlines of, of, of the building walls and so on. At the northern tip of, of Newfoundland, which was first excavated in the 1960s, the style of its buildings made clear um, they were constructed by Vikings who had arrived from Greenland in the 10th um, in the 900s or uh, the, the 1000s, but exactly where they they made their um, voyage, becoming the first Europeans to cross the Atlantic, is a debatable. Now they've got uh, wood um, from the site that they're, they're understanding and dating. The researchers took advantage of a rare solar storm um, that occurred in AD 992, significantly increased the amount of radioactive radiocarbon observed by trees the next year. Ah, so in other words, what, what, because there, there was a solar storm, they could identify precisely that wood that dated from a specific time, right? So if they looked for that wood, they'd be able to understand when people got to the settlement. By identifying a tree ring containing elevated levels of radiocarbon in each of the three samples, um, and then counting the number of rings to, to the bark edge of the wood, they found that the wood all came from trees that had been felled in AD 1021. So they look at the date in the tree ring sample of 992, then they count forward from that, working out the felling date. So we know that these were felled by people in the year 1021. The Vikings do not um, appear to have intended to colonize La Haute or Meadow in Canada. Um, it was a base for further exploration, a gateway to other sites. They were going to see um, what there was in the new territory that could benefit them. Among the coveted sources they collected from farther south, most likely from present day New Brunswick, were hardwood, lumber, butternuts, we've heard about that before, and possibly grapes. After a decade or so, the Vikings headed back across the sea. They decided it is very good land, but there is danger here because of the indigenous people. So we'll go home to Greenland and stay there. Interesting. So they're looking at this wood, dating it um, and knowing that we've got a precise date on people there in 1021. Love it. Nice. That's really significant. It helps us date when people are in North America. It's like we get to Christopher Columbus and we say people, Christopher Columbus um, got to um, uh, the New World in, in 1492. We know the Vikings got to 
Um, where's that date again? They got to Newfoundland, Newfoundland in 1021. You've got to call it Newfoundland, not Newfoundland, apparently. Um, you had somebody having an argument once. It's Newfoundland. No, it's Newfoundland. No, it's Newfoundland. That is, oh, God. You get people like that. Anyway, finally, you've got two last things. And, and Goff, you, you've got like five or six minutes to tell me about, um, in five or six minutes, you tell me of your most um, favourite lecture, and then, then we'll call it a day. So this is at Sidon in Lebanon. Um, we've got this mass grave there. Loads of bones there. Pretty long bones. They look quite healthy, actually. So these must be these must be quite wealthy people. Let's have a little read. I didn't know about this one at all. Very short, this. Shame, really. Um, a mass burial containing the remains of at least 25 soldiers who were killed defending Christian held Sidon during the Crusades was uncovered during the excavations close to the town's St. Louis Castle. Strange name to be in a Lebanon. Archaeologists uncovered a belt buckle of a style worn by French-speaking crusaders, as well as a coin dating to between 1245 and 1250. Mm -hmm. The objects led them to conclude that the men were likely killed during a 1253 attack by an army of Mameluk Sultanate, an Islamic empire that spanned Egypt, much of the Levant and part of the Arabian Peninsula from 1250 to 1517. Um, an archaeologist from Bournemouth University says that the large number of wounds to the men's necks suggest they were killed by assailants on horseback wielding heavy medieval weapons such as swords, axes, war clubs or maces, possibly while fleeing. Um, so as they retreated, they, they knocked these guys out. Bugger. Uh, this is one of this is one of only two archaeologically documented mass uh, burials of the Crusades, which is really interesting that we don't have many. Um, it's a bit like plague pits, isn't it? We don't find many of them, even though they're out there. For a period that is meant to be so full of violence and conflict, we actually have very little physical evidence of battle from the Crusades. And here we go. Uh, rest in peace, you guys, all 25 of you. Um, they look really good, really good cadavers, actually. Um, but, you know, I do, I've done archaeology for many years, as you know, Goff, and um, every time I... I'm quite shocked with the degree that human beings just kill each other like they do, just pointless. And then finally this, talking about control and um, things like that. Let's have this last one. This has been the running theme for um, the last year about slavery, but there we go. Um, there it is, um, hairs up on the back of the neck, um, a tag, Charleston, the person was number 853. They got no humanity, which is a shame. A tag worn by an enslaved person who was hired out by his or her enslaver has been discovered in the remnants of a kitchen, um, the campus of College Charleston. Such tags, which was issued from the late um, 1700s until 18. 63 i would say but clays were still being held by some people in particularly the south and the north until 1865 um bore registration numbers and ident identified enslaved people by their trade trades such as a carpenter blacksmith fisherman of domestic servant the example badge number 731 hang on a minute Ah, oh, right. The date is 1853. Sorry. And is stamped with the word servant. Well, we don't have there. That must be on the reverse side, mustn't it? So um, while other southern cities had similar hired labor arrangements, Charleston is the only one that produced such tags. Um, and weirdly enough, some dog tags were worn by soldiers in the south and the north, but, but not many. They were just like identifications of the family um, dog tags didn't really come until the First World War. They weren't issued properly then either. Uh, what is uncommon about this discovery is that this object was found in context, unlike many other examples now in the hands of private collectors that have no provenance. I think that's quite sad, actually. To, I, I couldn't, I couldn't keep any. It needs to be in a museum. It's not. It's, it's really personal. That's somebody's life we were talking about. An enslaved person living in the house may have discarded a tag in the half or someone on loan from across town may have lost it one day. Mm -hmm. oh, the repercussions would have been terrible. Property records for the kitchen and those who worked in it may help connect the object 
with specific enslaved individuals. These objects are emblematic of urban slavery and the way it worked in Charleston. You have a designation or an occupation and a connection to an individual that breaks through an um, amphorous group of um, enslaved humanity and allows for an ident identity and a, a personhood to emerge. And do you know what, Goff? Um, I, I really, slavery is really abhorrent, um, whether it's white, black slavery or whatever, right? But there is one thing, if you're identified as a carpenter and it's stamped on the back, right? Um, when you're freed from enslavement, I was a carpenter and this is, this is my, you know, I can prove I'm a carpenter. It's great, it's like a little passport in the past if we, if we jest on that. Um, on that note, Goff, um, I'm just gonna finish there now um, and we're gonna, we're gonna stop that. And I'm just gonna, um, any questions on that? And then I'm gonna ask you the big question. No, that was really interesting. Well, I think a lot of those uh, discoveries need uh, further looking at, don't you? Maybe at a later date. Definitely. Well, we're, in the new year, we're going to be looking at prehistoric stuff, but there's no reason why in the future we can't look at some of those. Yeah, we can lot, lots more to come. Uh, so if you've got no other questions on that, I want to ask the big question. Um, I'm going to write down the ones that I think might be, you're only, you're only allowed one, right? One person gave about six and I thought, no, you've got to have one your favourite. So I got two written that might have been your favourite lectures over the past year or so. What What is it? Well, I think... Obviously, because of my background, it would have to be the, the Newport ship. I, I, I got that. that. I loved that lecture the first time you did it a couple of years ago, and the second time with the follow-up lecture. And the reason is, is because like a lot of your lectures, it's not about monuments and uh, tombs to very rich and famous people. It's more about the common um, hairy-assed sailors yeah. doing commerce, coming up the river and going ashore and having a good time and then finding their ship a tur turn turtle in the dry dock and, and common, you know, dog, dog, fuck vulgaris, you know, and I, and I like that. I like that sort of thing. Can I just mention, uh, a sailor would have kept everything on him, so we would just seen this uh, ship um, uh, flown turtle and you'd just think, oh, right, it's fair enough, it's, it's, it's the owner's fault. So you wouldn't have left anything on board, would you? No, 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 no. And do you know that if I if I take a jest on another lecture that you may have liked over the past year and a half, um, just I've got another one on you. I'm just wondering if the, if I'm right or not. What could that have been? I didn't. I, I don't giving you much chance there. Well, they've all been pretty good. I do. I do like it when you go overseas. You know, I, I do like. I do like it. So. Um, it's hard to say because, you know, I, I wouldn't like to say. I, I've scribbled down Easter Island and I don't know why, but... Um... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I get it, yeah, yeah. 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 Very good, yeah. Eleanor was with us on that one. I think she did another yeah. one. Yeah. Very on, good. On, that, on that note, give my love to Eleanor, right? Yeah. Um, I will put out a video next week. It'll be Friday morning, uh, Thursday morning, Thursday morning, so you can watch it. Oh, um, <laughs> Will you email that or do you have to go onto the site or YouTube or it's what? It's going to be emailed to everybody. Okay. Good. Okay, then, well, thank you for all the years of lectures. It's been great. Then I look forward to next year. Yeah, we'll be doing mainly prehistory next year, but yeah. Yeah, whatever. You know. Yeah. Anyway, anything else you want to ask before you time off? No, that's it. Hey, say hello to everybody for me and um, you have a great Christmas and we're back, I think, um, the 5th of January. We're trying to get a letter out to everybody. It really depends if I can get my secretary to get it out in time. All right. OK. Bye bye. Okay. Then. Hey, you have a great time. Um, Merry, Merry Christmas. And I'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much for your support, Goff. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Did I actually have a phone call come in? I can't remember. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. And um, that's uh, live uh, from uh, Brecon again. And uh, I've, uh, yeah, Kylie wants to wipe a cup of tea now, so I'm going to have to go. It's going to make a lot of noise with the kettle. Um, and um, yes, and then she wants me to go outside and make a part. So I'm going to put that on YouTube as well. So uh, 
anyway um i'll 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 speak to you soon thank you very much for watching today and um and um let's see if uh, kylie's put a load of stone in the field so that i can get on with doing the next bit anyway thank you very much take care guys bye 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 thanks for don't forget to